Hello, my name is John Hittinger. I am a professor at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, and the founder and director of the John Paul II Forum. I wish to present to you an introduction to the thought of St. John Paul II through a study of his first encyclical entitled Redemptor Hominus, the Redeemer of Man. St. John Paul II, John Paul the Great, the 263rd successor to St. Peter. He had the third longest papacy in the history of the church. He made 104 international trips visiting 129 countries, 876 cities. He wrote 14 encyclicals. He helped to bring down the Iron Curtain, a champion of the poor and tireless advocate of religious freedom. It's not hard to understand why he's considered great. Professor Duffy of the University of Cambridge wrote, There is no mistaking his greatness. For years the Catholic Church has been led by a colossus whose personal experience encompasses the deepest horrors of the 20th century, and who has proclaimed the gospel as he understands it with the authority of his office and with his rare intelligence, high courage, and uncompromising integrity. No pope for centuries has had so direct an impact on human destinies, nor made such a mark on the church he serves and governs. Pope John Paul II was not only a beloved saint and spiritual leader, but a man of singular accomplishments. And now that he's declared a saint, the measure is even greater for us to understand because the world doesn't understand the saint. He's not declared a saint because he was great as the world judges greatness. But we could say he achieved such influence and greatness because he was a saint. His life was rooted in Christ, dedicated to Christ, transformed into Christ through prayer, suffering, and love. He taught what he lived. He lived what he taught, which is what returns us to this first encyclical, the Redeemer of Man. I would say this is his mission statement. His second encyclical on divine mercy provides his vision statement, but more on that in a future class. The central task of his pontificate was defined in this encyclical, to show the connection of the mystery of Christ and the dignity of the human person. The letter was issued in 1980, soon after he was elected Pope. Let's listen to his own words about the encyclical. Everything I said in the encyclical I brought with me from Poland. Those thoughts had been maturing in me previously, during my years of service as a priest and then as bishop. Christ wanted these calls of intellect and heart these expressions of faith, hope, and charity to ring out in my new and universal ministry right from the beginning. End of quote. This statement reveals so much about the importance of this document, Redemptor Hominus. It stands as a central relay point or tower, if you will, in the life of this great Pope and beloved saint. Those calls of intellect and heart which defined and animated his priestly life. He amplifies this teaching for the hearing of the whole church, indeed for the world at large. From the vantage point of this letter, Redemptor Hominus, we look forward to those achievements of his pontificate. He accomplished the mission given him. And we also have a vantage to look back to his life and service in his beloved Poland, this letter gives us an opportunity to see his life and work as a whole, even to catch some glimmer of that sanctity that characterized his life from an early age and grew in intensity as service and suffering bore such fruit of divine love. To provide a context for and the themes to study in Redemptor Hominus, I propose that we consider the following alliterative aspects of the life of John Paul II. He was Polish, a man of prayer. He was a poet and a playwright. He was ordained a priest. 
he was a philosopher, he became a pope, he was influential in politics. They all seem to work together there. And first we should consider his Polish roots. In lesson two, I will talk about his poetry and his love of the beautiful. In session three, his priesthood and his prayer. And in lesson four, his philosophy to set us up to read this encyclical. But I'd first like to share an anecdote concerning the one and only time I met this saint in person. It was prior to his election to the papacy. This encounter has led me to ponder for years, why would a Polish philosopher and poet become pope? In 1976, Cardinal Wotiwa visited the United States to attend the Eucharistic Congress in Philadelphia. He made a side trip to Washington, D.C., invited by my mentor, Jude Doherty. At the Catholic University of America, he gave a talk for the philosophy department. He was a professional philosopher, even though he was also the Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow. Karol Wotiwa was not well known in the United States, although he should have been. He was a major participant in the sessions of the Second Vatican Council. As Archbishop of Krakow, he took many courageous stands against communist aggression and oppression. Soon after his visit to the United States, when I met him, he claimed a major victory when he consecrated a church in the new town of Nova Huta, where the communists had tried to exclude religious buildings. While we graduate students attended, perhaps because of the novelty of hearing a Polish prelate, but also the title of his talk, The Transcendence of the Person in Action in Man's Self-Teleology. That paper was later published with other papers for a conference in phenomenology held in France that same month. The talk was held in the large auditorium in Caldwell Hall on campus, fairly well attended. Those who attended were treated to a very sophisticated treatment of Kant and Aristotle. The Polish philosopher spoke with a strong and confident voice in a somewhat halting English although he was well understood. We were all very impressed by his knowledge of Aristotle and his creative working of the tradition to incorporate and overcome the philosophy of Kant. After the talk at a reception, I was privileged to meet Cardinal Wotiwa. I was a young graduate student who had recently finished a semester-long study of the philosophy of Karl Marx. I approached the cardinal and introduced myself to this gracious man, but then blurted out, Your Eminence, what do you think of the Marxist-Christian dialogue? He took a moment to respond as a smile formed on his face, and he started to chuckle. He gently, if not wearily, said, Ah, it's more like a monologue. Everybody laughed. This response had all the features that we would come to know in the life of Pope John Paul II. It was diplomatic, it was humorous, but it packed a punch. The graduate student learned his lesson, but while all the Catholic colleges and social justice groups were buzzing about liberation theology and Marxist Christian dialogue, Cardinal Votiwa spoke from firsthand experience of Marxism, a close study of its philosophy, and expressed an extreme wariness of such a rapprochement. The following day at lunch, a fellow graduate student said, that man ought to be made Pope. And I responded with these words, are you kidding? He's a philosopher and he's Polish. He'll never be Pope. Of course, two years later, the Polish philosopher was made Pope. And I've come to see that he was made Pope in great reason because he was Polish and a philosopher. Cardinal Ratzinger reflected on the providential design of this. In 1998, at the 20th anniversary of the papacy of John Paul II, he said, quote, the crisis of post-conciliar theology is to a large extent the crisis of philosophical foundations. 
the form of philosophy presented in the theological schools was lacking in perceptual richness. It lacked phenomenology, and the mystical dimension was missing. And when his basic philosophical principles are unclear, theology finds the ground giving way beneath his feet, because it's no longer clear to what extent man truly understands reality and on what basis he can think and speak. So it seems to me it's a disposition of providence at this time that a philosopher has risen to the sea of Peter, a man who does not simply take his philosophy from a textbook, but exerts the effort necessary to meet the challenge of reality and of man's quest in questioning. That's Cardinal Ratzinger from my beloved predecessor. And as for his Polishness, Cardinal Ratzinger said, Young Wotiwa struggled with the problems of existence, not in a private sphere, but surrounded by the flames of major historical events. He worked in a factory where he read a metaphysics textbook because his professors were arrested and sent to Auschwitz. Attending the seminary was an act of resistance. The questions of freedom, human dignity, rights, political responsibilities conferred by faith did not enter the thoughts of the young theologian as merely theoretical problems. Facing these was the very real and concrete necessity of that historical moment. And because Poland was at the intersection of the East and West, it had a clear destiny to play. And the Pope needed is precisely this Polish heritage to take these cultures into account. This is Cardinal Ratzinger explaining the providential reasons why the man who was a philosopher and from Poland, Cardinal Wotiwa, would be providentially prepared to confront the questions of the period following the Second Vatican Council. Now, John Paul II himself said that his central message, that of divine mercy, is the fruit of Polish suffering and sanctity. Quote, right from the beginning of my ministry in St. Peter's in Rome, I considered this message of divine mercy my special task. Providence assigned to me in this present situation of man, the church, and the world. It could be said that precisely the situation assigned that message to me as my task before God. Or again, he said, on the threshold of the third millennium, I come to entrust once more my Petrine ministry and say, Jesus, I trust in you. I took with me the message of divine mercy to the see of Peter and which forms the image of this pontificate he said at the Shrine of Divine Mercy in Krakow. And then finally, about Sister Faustina, he said, it's by divine providence that this humble daughter of Poland was completely linked to the history of the 20th century, the century we have just left behind. It was between the First and Second World Wars that Christ entrusted to her his message of mercy. Those who remember and were witnesses to these events and the horrible sufferings caused for millions of people know well how necessary was the message of mercy, Jesus told Sister Faustina. From the diary, humanity will not find peace until it turns trustfully to divine mercy. Thus, through the work of this Polish religious, John Paul II said, the message is linked to the 20th century, the last of the second millennium, and the bridge to the third. It's not a new message, but it's a gift of special enlightenment that helps us to relive the gospel of Easter more intensely and offer it as a ray of light to men and women of our time. End of quote. Redemptor hominus is about Christ and the message of mercy. Coming out of this Polish experience, I would like to say a few more words about the importance of Poland in the life and thought of John Paul II. First, Poland 
is a profoundly Catholic country. Its very founding in 966 coincides with its acceptance of the Christian faith. There is a deep Catholic culture in Poland. Christianity permeates its history, literature, language, architecture. John Paul II would later praise St. Cyril and Methodius in his fifth encyclical, I believe, for the striking role they played in the evangelization of the Slavic people and the model for the whole church on how to enculturate faith. Number two, Poland is a meeting place of East and West, a crossroads of culture. Pope John Paul II would say the church must breathe with both lungs, East and West. He learned a tradition of toleration with deep roots of harmony between diverse religions and cultures. Third, Poland is a mystical and poetic country, a great literary and religious tradition that Karol Wojtyla deeply absorbed, a humanism and religiosity of its culture. My friend Frank Zamet, who's made a documentary about John Paul II, said the following, quote, he loved the 19th century poets Slovaki and Mikhevich, in whom the beauty and pain of Poland was so alive. They deal with patriotic themes, nat national uprisings, the thirst for freedom, and Polish messianism. You know, in 1966, Poland celebrated the millennium celebration of the reception of the faith. And Cardinal Wyszynski was called the millennial cardinal because he fought the communist to celebrate this. And Karol Wojtyla was schooled in this tradition and responded deeply to it. And you know, Cardinal Wyszynski referred to John Paul as the millennial pope, that you will become pope and lead the church into the new millennium. Fourth point would be Poland is a country or nation which for centuries had no state, no power by which to control and manipulate others. The Polish people developed a strong sense of language and culture, as well as compassion for justice and liberation. When John Paul II went before UNESCO to talk about culture, he said, I am the son of a country which has been denied for centuries its political existence but we exist through culture and the appreciation of culture. And that's why John Paul II again said that the conclave wanted to call upon the witness of the church in Poland when he was elected Pope for the good of the universal church. John Paul saw bringing his Polish experience was not incidental but part of divine providence. So, quote, here's another quote, not without reason have the Polish people throughout their history sought alliances and united with their closest neighbors, and not without reason did they fight for freedom. This is the spiritual heritage of the Poles that John Paul felt such deep solidarity with his people and with the nations that suffer. You know, in our own history, we know that there were Polish freedom fighters who helped in our own revolution. Kosciuszko, there is a national monument to him in Philadelphia. He went back to Poland to fight for Polish freedom. And we know throughout their oppression by the communists, the struggle of the Polish people against communism highlighted the great Catholic culture. A close friend of John Paul II and scholar Rocco Buttiglioni wrote a wonderful book on the thought of Carol Wotiwa, the man who would become John Paul II. And I want to read to you a passage from his chapter on Poland. Quote, thousands of times defeated on the terrain of force, the nation is reborn each time thanks to the spiritual awareness of its own identity animated by Christian faith. 
the essence of this particular vision of man which nourishes the Polish consciousness is a cultural and existential certitude that Christ is the keystone for understanding of man in history. That, my friends, is the opening line of Redemptor Hominus. It's in John Paul II's heritage, his blood, his life experience. That was, I added that in to Buttiglione's quote, which I'll go back to, that that certitude is lost or weakened in the West. We are blinded by potential for domination that the Industrial Revolution offered them. And these countries have made the measure of their dignity coincide with their power. They have built great national states and sought to expand at the expense of their neighbors, which they have divided among themselves, the defenseless people of all regions, Poland being, for example, divided. Back to Buttiglione. These states are opposed to the church, which contested this reorganization in the name of their domination of others. But things developed differently in Poland. The struggle for a national state was defeated. Two great rebellions of 1831 and 1863 did not succeed and were extinguished in blood. Although the Polish revolutionaries were defeated on the ground of politics, they were able to retreat and recover on the ground of culture. They had never broken with the church. They saw in the development of Christian consciousness of the people the most solid foundation of the national idea. In Poland, spiritual identity is constituted outside of the state and even in an open struggle with existing states by setting the force of the right of the individual and of the nation which has its root and its defense in God, in their opposition to the right of force exercised by the most powerful in the world. End of a long quote by Rocco Buttiglione, which expresses so well the importance of Poland in John Paul II's ministry to the world, his defense of rights, his love of culture, the solid rootedness in the certitude of Jesus Christ. Now again, going back to Professor Duffy of Cambridge University, he made a statement to Frank Zamet that suffering is crucial for understanding John Paul at a personal level and also at a racial, ethnic, historical, and theological level. His personal life is one of enormous personal deprivation. The loss of his mother when he was very young. The loss of his brother, who was perhaps the person he was closest to in the world. And then when he was a young man, before he really shaped his own life choices, the loss of his father, whose piety had been crucial in shaping his own religion. But the Polish people for 200 years had been a victim people, partitioned between Germany and Russia, religiously oppressed, enslaved, abandoned by the world at the beginning of the Second World War. And that experience of desolation for him is part and parcel of the religious desolation of the East, a church which is a church of silence, cut off from the West, what he feels he has given the churches of the East a special vision, a special access to the gospel of the crucified. Personal suffering for him chimed in perfectly and became an image of this greater vocation. End of quote by Professor Duffy. And then fifth, I would add, Carol Wotiwa was born and raised during the miracle on the Vistula the river that flows through the middle of Warsaw. Cardinal Józef Wotiwa, whose rise to the papacy signaled new hope for his nation, was born on the very day of the great modern reckoning for the Polish people, May 18, 1920, a day called the Polish Miracle. On that day, Marshal Józef 
Pilsudski struck a deciding blow in war against the Soviet Union and seized Kiev. It was Poland's first major military victory in over two centuries, and set in motion events which briefly restored Poland's independence, the time of John Paul II's youth. Mindful of the nation's turning point, Carol's father gave his new son Pilsudski's middle name, Josef. Some have said he was named after Mary's self-sacrificing husband, but the confluence of history and religion go together. That's the significance of Poland. He belonged to a generation who breathed the Prussian and defeat in the air around them, but unlike their parents, they knew what freedom tasted like. Wotiwa was a great lover of freedom because he knew its worth. In 1976, Cardinal Wotiwa visited the Orchard Lake schools in Michigan. I later taught there and come to love the tradition of the Orchard Lake schools. This was before coming to Catholic U when I met him. He gave the following speech, showing the importance of Poland and Polonia as a way to see the crisis of the world today. He said, we are confronting the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church of the gospel and the anti-gospel. We all realize it's not an easy matter and a great deal depends upon the outcome on the vistula. I think that Polonia is most aware of it, but other layers of American society are less enlightened in this respect and just eliminate the problem from their sphere of interest. But Polonia, that is, the Polish people in America, share Poland sentiments and feel the significance of the confrontation, that is, between communism and freedom, the church and totalitarianism, going on at the banks of the Vistula, a trial of our nation and the church, but a test of 2,000 years of culture and Christian civilization, with all of its consequences for human dignity, human rights, and rights of nations. As the number of people who understand the importance of this confrontation increase in Poland and America, we can look with greater trust towards the outcome of this confrontation. The Church has gone through many trials, as has the Polish nation, and emerged victorious, even at the cost of great sacrifice. You see that weight of Poland, John Paul II, suffered and bore much fruit, and that was brought to the papacy. It was during that visit to the United States he came to the Catholic University. He's right that few Americans understood this confrontation. I certainly did not understand these matters as a graduate student at Catholic University nor did I hear many professors address the root crisis, certainly not as the Pope has addressed it, which is at the heart of this encyclical Redemptor Hominus. But this is why we needed the Polish Pope, because Poland was a fault line in which communism and Nazism both vied to dominate and exterminate the church. And the Poles heroically and single-handedly battled these barbaric and atheistic totalitarian forces and ultimately prevailed through faith, hope, and love. And John Paul II saw the West developing its own form of darkness and oppression, not in the same way as those totalitarian monsters, but a moral evil, political oppression of basic rights of life and religious freedom. So John Paul II saw the importance of the faith. I might also mention his devotion to Mary, he saw, as being in part due to the intercession of Mary. I mean, one could say in whole, I should actually say that, but th through the grace of Christ, through the Blessed Mother, the victory, if it comes, will come through Mary, were the prophetic words of one of the Polish cardinals who died before the end of the war. And John Paul II said that those words were coming true. 
1920, that year that John Paul II was born, the Polish Episcopate met at Jasnogora, at Czestochowa, as the Bolshevik army was close at hand, and they proclaimed Mary Queen of Poland. And when the Red Army reached Warsaw, thousands of Poles traveled to Jasnogora, to their queen, to beg her for victory, which duly came on August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption. That is the miracle of the Vistula, attributed to Our Lady's intercession. Now, I will mention one last point here. Through the Interpretation of George Weigel, who's the chief biographer of John Paul II. He said, history viewed from the Vistula River Basin looks different because it has a tangible spiritual dimension. Looking at history from that angle of vision teaches the observant that overwhelming material force can be resisted successfully through the resources of the human spirit through culture, and that culture is the most dynamic and enduring factor in human affairs, at least over the long haul. Carol Wotiwa, later known as Pope John Paul II, applied this lesson of the priority of culture in history, in resistance, to the two great totalitarian powers, to our lessons of the day and for the church in the world today, that the spiritual and cultural battle continues. And as John, as Carol Wotiwa said at Orchard Lake, the moderates and liberals may continue to eliminate the problem from their sphere of interest. And politicians, educators, and leaders may be oblivious to the culture of death and the primacy of these pro-life issues. Too many fail to support this mission to promulgate and inculcate the whole truth about man and God. And that's how we'll plant the seeds of Catholic culture, to see the Redeemer of man, Jesus Christ, inculcating the dignity of the person and leading us to redemption. We must join John Paul II in raising awareness of this spiritual and cultural context confrontation and cultivate this legacy of blessed John Paul II so that we have the spiritual, philosophical, and cultural principles we need to advance and prevail that are outlined in this encyclical Redemptor Hominus. Now, even in that dark side of history that I have gone over for the last 10 or 15 minutes, we will see that John Paul II finds the signs of hope. He was a man of hope, a witness to hope. He said, do not fear. Open the door to Christ. So that even in the death camp set up by the Nazis at Auschwitz, not far from, where, from Krakow, where John Paul II was bishop, he would see the hope that rose up out of saints. For example, he will celebrate Maximilian Kolbe and call him the patron saint of this difficult century. Maximilian Kolbe, a Polish Franciscan missionary who lived in Japan at Nagasaki years prior to its bombing and then returned to Poland to be captured and sent to Auschwitz. John Paul II paid special attention to the protection and promotion of the dignity of the person. And that's why he sees in Maximilian Kolbe, the man who would stand up to witness to life and to offer his life in sacrifice for others is a sign of victory. We will return to this theme in a later lesson, but I think for now, to understand, again, the significance of Poland and the Polish experience in its dark days and its oppression, 
but also in the signs of hope.